All right, what's up, guys? We've got exploit vulnerabilities today. Um, pretty good box. I think it uh, shows the concept overall, and it's a pretty good example of what you need to have in your mind when you're going through these. All right. This is definitely the methodology that a lot of hackers use. So I think it's important to understand it, right? So here we have Nessus. It's just at, telling us the automation versus the manual vulnerability research. We have the Nessus vulnerability scanner is what they use as an example. There's a lot of a lot of vulnerability scanners out there. Um, you can see they have an actual whole room dedicated to Nessus. Nessus is a very good scanner and very popular in the enterprise world. So I'm not surprised they have it here. Um, so now the advantages and disadvantages. So advantages, you can customize scans to do anything you want. They use signatures. They use um, KB numbers on Windows patching. They use uh, pretty much anything you could think of. You can make the scanner do. You can have the scanner log in for you to test that it's, it's actually working the way you think. Um, you can have all kinds of stuff. That Now, granted, the more stuff you have a scanner doing, the more it's going to clog up the network because it's acting as if it's using real traffic. And I say that like it's a not really doing it. It's acting in part as another node or human interacting. So when I say that, imagine you have, uh, you know, 500 computers, right? And at any one time, you might have 300 people logged in. And if you get four or 500 people logged in, then the traffic starts to die down a little bit. Or meaning like it, you're starting to see a little latency and stuff like that, right? Well, now if you scan with Nessus, let's say you don't have it configured correctly and you have all 500 scans go at once. Now it's like it's just like having 500 people on at once. You're going to bog down that network. So I would say the disadvantage is it has to be configured properly and at the correct times. So you have to know your network pretty well. Um, you can see here open source solutions are often basic and require expensive licenses. Nessus is an example of this. The free community edition is basic. You will need the license if you're doing it for an enterprise system. Um, and they are pricey but they are worth it in my opinion. Um, now here, this is a big one. They often do not find every vulnerability on an application. That is true. The reason that's true is because number one, depending on what you give it permission to do is dependent on what it can do. So meaning if you give it actual root access, it can find more vulnerabilities than if you don't. Um, that type of stuff. Along with the fact that there's still zero day exploits out there and these use signatures, meaning they're looking for specific hashes, specific files, specific things like that, that are known to exist for that vulnerability. Um, and then that's what they're going to do if they're looking for actual exploits on the machine, but they're also looking for security misconfigurations and a lot of other things. So depending on how in tune you have these, um, scanners going, they're not going to hit everything. I mean, it's almost impossible to hit everything. You have to have a pen test done to really get that in-depth look. So keep that in mind. This is not going to simulate a pen test and do it for you. Um, now, the disadvantage, one thing I forgot to mention, they are extremely loud, meaning they're producing a lot of traffic and a lot of logs. Um, I can definitely attest to that. So if you tried to do this with a pen test, meaning you just tried to use a scanner instead of actually do the scans yourself, you're going to get caught almost instantly. Um, now, if you don't care, meaning you have full permission, everyone knows you're there, it doesn't matter if you get caught, yeah, go for it. It'll probably find some stuff that you don't because it has more time and it can just sit there and automate stuff. So it's, it's you know, pros and cons. You got to weigh it out and figure out what you think. Now, here's some different vulnerabilities for you, the kinds that we're going to be looking at. Um, security misconfigurations, this is obvious. If you misconfigure something, and a good example I like to use is if you have a um, if you have a configured where you're supposed to have after three t password attempts, your password locks out, right? A lot of people know that. A lot of websites adhere to that rule. Now, what if you accidentally typed 30 or 300 instead on the group policy instead of three? Well, now it's easy to guess your password because it's never going to lock your account out. So that's a, that's a misconfiguration, meaning it was supposed to be configured correctly and it was not, um, meaning it that the application is not broken. There's nothing wrong with it. It's misconfigured. Um, broken access controls. 
This is pretty common. You're going to see this when uh, someone's trying to impersonate someone. It's you are accessing something you shouldn't. So for instance, if this setup here, um, logged in, login equals, you know, stuffy24 and I changed it to login equals admin and I get to see the admin, that's broken access control. I shouldn't have been able to do that, but I can. So it's a broken access control. Um, insecure deserialization. Again, if you guys have seen up here where this is just a bunch of random scribbles, um, if I can deserialize that, meaning I can de-encode it and take it out and then change it and then re-encode it and put it in and it lets me in or, what, or lets me do something I shouldn't, that's insecure deserialization. It means I was able to deserialize it and pass code to you. Um, that's a little bit very simplified version of what deserialization is and there's multiple different examples. That's just a kind of, excuse me, give you guys an example of what, what you may see or um, injection. You guys have heard of, the, of SQL injections and things like that. Um, injection is simple. It allows you to pass code to the back end database server. And the easiest way to stop that is simple. It's just input validation. Make sure that what they're typing in is what is supposed to be typed in. Meaning if you have a username field, you're typing a username, not typing code and it's accepting it. All right. So you're working close to a deadline for your pen test and need to scan a web app quickly. Would you automate your scan? Yes, because you're close to the deadline and you've got to hurry. You're not worried about getting caught at this point. You're worried about getting them some results. So yes, um, you're testing a web app and find that you are able to input and retrieve data in a database. What vulnerability is this? We just covered that. That's injection because I'm able to put in and take out data in a database. I'm injecting code or whatever I'm injecting information into that database. You managed to impersonate another user. What vulnerability is this? Broken access controls because I'm seeing something I shouldn't. I'm able to access something that I otherwise would not be able to. All right. So now finding manual exploits. Okay. So the rapid seven GitHub and search exploit are the three they're going to cover rapid seven. Again, just a database. You can search it for specific vulnerabilities. Very good database here. You can see they're giving it actually sometimes will give you um, word for word instructions on how to do this. This is using Metasploit framework and it's telling you use targets. Boom, boom. It's telling you exactly how to use it. So that's nice to see. GitHub sometimes will give you that as well. Give you instructions. Um, and then you can see here, this is where developers can upload stuff. So there's a lot of proof of concepts on here, meaning that someone might say, Hey, I found this vulnerability. I uploaded on my GitHub page you go to it and the get and it might work it might not because it they may have a specific um, set of circumstances that works that yours doesn't the other thing to be careful with with github is they could be dubious people meaning if you don't know how to read the code and you have no idea what you're downloading that's where you get in trouble script kitties do that don't do that read the code figure out what they're trying to do with it and even if you can't type the code word for word meaning you aren't a uh, uh, super proficient in that coding know what they're trying to do and make sure you're not getting screwed um keep that in mind because not only that but a lot of codes on github and any any you know site you get it from you have to edit it somehow to get it to work 90 percent of the time so you need to know what you're looking at um search exploit search exploit is actually on most i think every cali distro but it's also on parrot and a bunch of other um linux distros it's just an offline database that you can update that actually downloads vulnerabilities for you that you can then use. Okay. Um, so what website would you use as a security feature for proof of concept? And that would be GitHub. And if you're per performing a pen test and you have no internet connection, that'd be search split because it's offline. All right. Examples of manual exploitation here. They just give you an example. Um, so here's the exploit. It's, exploit.py they open it they edit it so this is before so they they have this ip and this port now they change it here to their their specific ip now that's important because like i said most exploits you're going to have to change some way um here you can see they actually type help and it gives them help commands if it's written correctly and it's a good exploit um yeah it'll give you it usually has a help menu almost like any linux um, help commands. 
Um, here you can see they type the exploit, they give it a URL, which is what it's what it's expecting. You can see here they type help. It says tac u is the URL, and then tac c is the command. So then they do tac c and who am I, and they get the information. There they do it with flag.txt, and they get the actual flag. All right, perfect. So now we're going to start diving in. So let's go ahead, show split view. We have this box here. This is the website that we're trying to attack right here. Welcome to CMnatics Bookstore. <clears throat> All right, so it says here, deploy the machine, uh, da, 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 navigate to it, and try and find... Okay, so now the first question is what is what version of the application is running? Well, if you look down here, we just went to the bookstore. This is just where we started. Um, I don't know if there's another place where it might have this. You could in map it and things like that to find this. But if you just go to the website, it says right here, it's online bookstore version 1.0. So here's online bookstore version 1.0. That's the answer. Now, here's the question. How do we find vulnerabilities for that? Well, you could go to any of those databases that we covered, but what I'm going to do is go here and say search exploit. Now, keep in mind it's offline, so if I do it with no with nothing, we get the page that tells us what to how to work for, and look at it, right? So you can look at that and you can figure out how it works. So now we'll do search exploit and we'll say online bookstore, and we hit enter, and you can see here we have four different um, vulnerabilities. We have online bookstore, unauthenticated remote code execution. That's what we want. We want remote code execution. Um, I can tell you 90% of the time, if you want to take over a machine, you want remote code execution, okay? So you just look here. This is the number of it, 47887.py. So we just would search exploit, tac m, which is going to copy it to our machine, 47887 dot py we hit enter and it's asking if we want to override it now i'm going to say no but that's because i already had done this before for you guys now when we go to ls it's in our root directory so you can see right there 47887.py and you could rename it if you wanted or whatever you want to do now first thing i'm going to do is type python 47887.py now I'm gonna do it with no. Now first thing I would do actually, but I already know what this does, is I would read the script. So I already know what it does, I already read it. Um, if you find it in search exploit, I wouldn't worry too much about it being a, a virus or anything like that. But if you just hit Python, uh, you can see I hit with nothing and it says URL. You need the following arguments are required, the URL. So I have to give it the URL. So let's give it the URL and we'll say HTTP 10.10.183.211 and we hit enter. And wow, it says, do you wish to launch a shell here? So we already have a shell. Boom, remote code execution, we already have it. So now if we hit LS, Boom, there's our flag, flag.txt. Now, let's see where we are, present working directory. Okay, so if we just go cat flag.txt, we have try hack me bookkeeping, and there's our final flag. That's it, guys. The box is easy. And that's one of the only, um, ex or that's one of the only vulnerability or exploits that I've seen where you don't have to change anything. You just type in the website and it gives you a remote executed code. You didn't have to add your port or your IP or anything. So it's very useful, very easy. Now there are there was four vulnerabilities in there. So we could go through and do the SQL injection. Um, we could go through the arbitrary file upload and upload our own file. Um, that's what it's doing basically but we could do all that but we didn't have to they already had remote code execution for us so keep that in mind guys sometimes it's that easy um i wouldn't say it's gonna ever be that easy in real practice for you but it can be that easy so hopefully you guys liked it hopefully you guys are enjoying the series we're gonna keep going with it um let me look at what the next one is let's go ahead and terminate that terminate that 
The next one in the learning path is vulnerability capstone. So this one, and then we have the actual metasploit and privilege execution, and we're 75% done, guys. We're freaking flying through this. So hopefully you guys like it, and hopefully we can keep doing uh, at least two to three videos a week. And keep subbing, guys. We're up to 250 or something like that. We're close. Uh, we're going for 500. When we get to 500, I will ask the Discord, um, and we will do a special video. Um, I think I already have one in mind from one of the viewers that spoke with me in the Discord, and I think I know what I'm going to do, but I want to reach that 500 mark first, and we'll do a special video for you guys. Hopefully you guys like it. Like and subscribe if you do, and I appreciate it. Thanks, guys.